This is Leicester Till I Die TV. Watch and subscribe on YouTube and listen on your podcast platform. Hi everybody, Jerry Taggart here. Now be sure to watch Chris and Leicester Till I Die TV by subscribing on YouTube and following them on social media for all the latest Leicester City news and information. Come on you foxes! Strap yourself in because we're set up, switched on and ready to go. Hello Fox fans, how the devil are we? Welcome along to another show. Um, let's face it, there's nothing on telly to watch. There's no football at the moment. The Euros haven't started. You might as well watch less than till I die. <laughs> what else have you got to do? Watch this. On YouTube and your favourite podcast platform, this, this is, is Lesser Till I Die TV. TV. In conversation with... It is indeed, it is our In Conversation With uh, show. It's second in a series of two. No, I'm only joking. It's, 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 hopefully we'll have more than that. It's our second show and it is Lester Till I Die. You can catch us live on the old Facebook group, Lester Till I Die. Uh, if you're in Twitter land, it's at Lester TID. And you can watch this on YouTube on the Lester Till I Die channel. And uh, if you are watching it on uh, YouTube, please smash that like button hit the notification and of course give us a subscribe it does help us build the channel we would be forever grateful um <laughs> melina good evening um uh, my, my 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 mod here I tell, i'm trying to uh Trying to do something here and it, it's not working. I'm trying to pin my my, my chat there. <laughs> FA Cup at FFS. Never going to forget you won the FA Cup, eh, hey, Melina? I'm never going to let you forget we win won the FA Cup. You know, um, <laughs> nice hat. Thank you very much, um, Solomon. Hello to you as well. I'm guessing from that picture you could be a West Ham fan. Nice to nice to join us. We'll see you in Europe next season. It is, like I say, in conversation with. Now, you know, if you're a regular, regular watcher of um, Less Until I Die, you'll you'll know who this guy is. We managed to dig him out of the 19th hole again for tonight's show. Um, not not that he goes much, you understand, you know. But uh, but uh, I don't know if he plays the previous 18. That'll have to be one of the questions we'll ask him. <laughs> but uh, he is, of course, our chat chum, Julian Watts. So let's, I've insulted him enough. Let's bring him in before he decides to leave and say, good evening, Julian. Good evening, Chris. You all right? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Yeah, really well, mate. Really well. Good. Now, just pro you're not in the 19th hole at the moment, are you? <laughs> No, no, not today. It's uh, that, that's another day or two or three, I think. <laughs> and why not? But uh, why is it? I mean, you know, you, Gareth Bale, you know, all the top players. Why is it <laughs> with with footballers and golf? Well, I know in our day we didn't have much to do in the afternoons. I think it's changed a lot now. But you know, yeah. the afternoons uh, later on in the week, you'd probably go and play golf because uh, you weren't allowed to go to the pub or, or the bookies. So uh, golf was the uh, best option as the week went by. 
did it actually stop anybody going to the bookies? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, we did. We did. I mean, we uh, like I say, a lot differently to uh, how the guys have to live in in the current climate. But um, yeah. I think, like you know, we wouldn't. We've never passed a Wednesday. Uh, you know, if we had a Saturday game, so but we did enjoy a few beers in my time at Leicester. And the odd, the odd game of snooker, honestly, boss, going to play snooker. <laughs> yeah, we, we were frequent um customers at Willie Thorns, yes. So I used to go up there in the afternoon, snooker pool, play a few games of cards, and what have you. And we were always made uh, very welcome by Willie, yeah. And uh, RIP Willie, of course, he passed away Absolutely. earlier in the year. Um, uh, and I never forget actually watching him win um, the, the, the the competition that he did. It was always it was always nice to see. Of course, we've got Mark Selby these days. Um, Melina Melina's asking, uh, "What is your most memorable game?" We'll come on to that later, Melina, because I, I think I think I can guess a couple. To be honest <laughs> with you, um, but tell you, you you you're a Yorkshire lad. Um, yep. How did you get into football? How were you spotted? Uh, it's a funny one, to be honest with you. I was playing, I was always okay at school and, and through Sunday leagues, but I was never the best player in the team. And I know at 14 years of age, most of the players in a good Sunday league team that I was in were signed up by the local clubs and I wasn't. And I, I sort of ended up playing for the best of the rest. Um, and then I went into men's football when I was 16, which probably did me the world of good because it's, it's a really tough league. It's still around now uh, called the Northeast Counties. It's about step 10, I think. Uh, and all the all the all the my teammates were like sort of 30 30 plus and there was me at 16 years of age and I had to grow up and toughen up really quickly and um at the time I had very wild long spiky hair and I was six foot three and the the guy who finally spotted me for uh, Rotherham John Brecken he'd, he'd seen me play and thought I was too old because of the, uh, <laughs> the style in which I uh, yeah in which I cultivated my hair um, it, it but, wasn't a mullet, was it, by any chance? It, it wasn't far off, if I'm honest. I don't think it was called a mullet in those days. But, <laughs> but, but, but yeah, for all sense and purposes, a mullet. And uh, anyway, he, he had a conversation with my dad, found out my age. And in, in those days, it was the YTS scheme. I was already at college. Um, so I used to get a day off and he invited me to come and train with the junior team, uh, the YTS lads. Uh, when I, at that age, I would have been a, a second year YTS. And they invited me to stay on the season after. But interestingly, I'd started as a midfield player and it was John Breckin who I, I, owe, I owe a great debt to because he was convinced I was a centre-back uh, and I was absolutely convinced that I was anything but a centre-back. And <laughs> eventually that's where I ended up. And it probably, if it wasn't for John Breckin, you know, I probably wouldn't yeah. have had a career because I certainly wasn't a good enough midfield player. It's amazing how many players uh, start in one position, but when they actually make it, if you like, it's in a co completely different position because somebody comes along and just sees something in you, doesn't that? Don't they? Yeah, they do. I mean, you know, at the school team when I was a you know a nipper, I started off as a right winger. Really fancied myself yeah. there. I think Peter Barnes was a, a hero of mine, and um, yeah, I just gradually through about sort of five or six years. Uh, got deeper and deeper in the team and ended up at the back. But uh, like I say, it was, you know, a great spot by John. Um, yeah. and it, and it enabled me, it, this was at Rotherham United, uh, to get a contract as as the sort of season came to a close. But I knew in I knew in the March that uh, I was going to be offered a contract by Billy, Billy McEwen, the manager. Um, and when you say Peter Barnes, was that the Man United Peter Barnes or the Harvey Barnes? The Dad, yeah, <laughs> that was the right winger at Leeds United at the time, Peter Barnes. So uh, very oh. excellent. And that's you know that's that's who we used to see on the big match on Sunday as it was then, and yes. uh, quite an exciting winger. And I, I think I fancied myself there, but probably didn't realise how tall I was going to be by the time I'd stopped uh, growing. <laughs> you said then that Rotherham United, and I, I I suppose because Leicester. Let's be honest with you, we've not long. You know, that used to be us, one of the what you would call smaller clubs, if you like. You know, we were never, we're still not probably classed as like one of the elite or one of the, you know, big, greedy, rich, sick, whatever you want to call them. But these smaller clubs, they're the lifeblood. And they were then, and I believe they still are now, the lifeblood of of the football pyramid. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'd take that right the way down to grassroots. There are still one mm. or two players, your Jamie Vardy's it's happened to myself. Yeah. There's a couple of others who come up and, you know, probably think they've missed the boat. And, and, you know, with a lot of hard work and a bit of dedication, they can, you know, they've still got that opportunity. And that's just the, the standard of non-league and the, the league that I spoke about, the North East Counties, the standard yeah. in that league is, is excellent now. And, you know, players still are being watched in that league and they could probably nick a, you know, a very good non-league or maybe, you know, lower league contract. So, I mean, yeah. hilariously, when I signed for, for Rotherham, I think they, they paid Freshville something like 12 mitre multiplexes and some bibs and cones. So uh, that was my first ever transfer fee. <laughs> was it, um, I think Brian Clough at Nottingham Forest, though, when, he, when he was at Derby, one of the, one, on a, well, one of the middles, but one of the clubs he was at, and he got paid in green uh, sweatshirts, <laughs> if I if I Now, that might just be a myth. I don't know. Uh, I know sort of when when football started to get out of hand, we started, I know, you know clubs in this country used to start buying players from abroad because they were cheaper. Because, you know, after the Black... I think it was sort of Blackburn, really, that started it all off with Jack Walker. Uh, but... You know, now people say, oh, no, how do Leicester do this? You know, we go and get Jamie Vardy from, you know, from the conference. We get James Justin from um, uh, uh, Luton Town, you know, and there's nothing to stop the big clubs doing that, but they just want the ready-made players, don't they? Yeah, and I think, you know, I think that's the frustration for probably a lot of, you know, young English players, and I think we've seen it in the media quite a lot, you know, um, where like Jaden Sancho has gone abroad, Jude Bellingham has gone abroad and they look like fantastic players, but probably wouldn't have had that opportunity, you know, uh, in, in the UK. And, and it's like you said, I think there's that much money in the game that managers are under super, super pressure to walk into a club and instantly sort of achieve the results and get the team playing the way they want. And realistically, if they do do it in a short time of frame, it's probably as much to do with luck than, than judgment or their coaching. Yeah. It's it's such a difficult thing for a manager to stamp his style of play and his, his team ethics onto a brand new group of players, unless they're sort of, you know, nearly in that frame themselves anyway. So, you know, the, the, like I say, the money from Sky and everything else is, is making it, you know, the, like they say, they want an instant wins and, the, the league's just not that easy, is it? We all know the Premier yeah. League, how difficult it is. And, and on the back of that, we've seen how fantastic this season that Leicester's recruitment has been through all the injuries and the, the players that probably aren't recognised as superstars today, but more than likely will be tomorrow. Yeah. And talking about big clubs, you got to move there. And at the time, I believe they were. Um, and, I, and I think of Sheffield Wednesday as one of the one of the big clubs. You know, it was the they always used to host the um, sadly on some occasions uh, mm. cup semi finals and what have you. But uh, how did I mean that was you know a, a good move, wasn't it? Because I imagine Sheffield United at that time in Yorkshire. I know you've got Leeds, but they were seen as one of the big boys. They were, and it's, it's a funny one. Um, I'd, I was playing for Rotherham, and uh, someone I knew knew Emlyn Hughes. Uh, and he came to watch me at a game and it was a game when the keeper got injured and uh, Tony Cunningham came and played at the back with me uh, and, and the, the centre-half went in goal and I sort of had to marshal Tony Cunningham who was probably 35, 36 and a lot more experienced than I had and Emily actually recommended me to Dave Bassett at Sheffield United and I went there for two weeks uh, and nothing came of it. David said, you know, I'd done okay and the usual chat of, you know, you're not better than anything I'd, I'd got. So I went back to Rotherham but literally within a few days... Uh, I was told that, you know, there was a trial at Sheffield Wednesday and I went there for two weeks uh, and that was a little bit more successful and, you know, ended up signing the contract there. So it was a bit of a funny one for me. Um, you know, I lived in the Sheffield Wednesday part of town. A lot of my friends were, were Wednesday supporters. So it was a good move in a way and it was obviously, as I saw it at the time, progression. Uh, but unfortunately, I didn't play too many games there. You didn't, but and I think you went out on loan as well while you were there, didn't you? I am I am relying on Wikipedia here, so I have, <laughs> every question I ask because I, I, I chatted with Paul Reed uh, earlier in the week, and and his Wikipedia page is like completely wrong. So please please correct me if um, I'm wrong. But you probably hear a little bit of doubt in my questions every time. No, I say no, it. no, no. <laughs> I, I ended up. I think Richie Barker, our assistant manager, uh, obviously had an association with Shrewsbury Town. John Bond was the manager there. And another sort of, I look back at my career and I've had some interesting times because John was a, a fascinating guy. I'd be laughing and telling jokes in his big camel jacket, you know, 10 minutes before we went out, you know, onto the pitch. He was a, a real large. Mm -hmm. Oh, 
And I think Julian I managed was, um... to play for two months, um, uh, and it was very enjoyable. You just froze there at the end, Julian, so we didn't quite catch what you got at the end. No, just to say, I, I played there mm. for two months. After a month, mm. Trevor Francis wanted me to come back, and we had a bit of a, a little, tiny little argument where I just insisted that I wanted to stay because I knew my first team chances at, at Wednesday were really limited at the time. And so he, he let me stay for another month. So I had two months first team football at Shrewsbury. And, and again, it was a real good part of my development. And how, obviously, the next club then was the, the biggest club you ever played for, Leicester <laughs> City. <laughs> uh, how, how did that move come about? Again, it was it was quite weird at the time. I'd uh, I'd decided I was leaving Wednesday. Uh, I was out of contract, which it could be in those days. Uh, and then Trevor Francis got the sack, and Pleat came in, and Pleat asked to you know to have a look at me, and would I stay you know for pre-season so we could have a look. And I ended up playing. We were in the Intertoto Cup, and I, I think I played all right. bar one of the Intertoto Cup games and started the first six games of the season. Uh, after that, he pulled me back out of the team, and. It was funny, I was sort of in and out of the team uh, all season um, and he, he kept telling me that Martin and John had been to watch you know, the games and they'd been ringing mm. him, asking him questions about me. They always were very thorough in the homework of players and I, I thought it was quite strange at the time. Like I say, I was out of contracts on a week-to-week -week contract uh, and he mentioned it several times. He'd come up to me in training, Martin was asking about you last night, but nothing came of it. But it was um, just the day before deadline day, we had a a friendly at West Brom, not a friendly, sorry, a reserve game. And I played there with a couple of the first team lads, had a good game and uh, I got the phone call in the morning that, um, you know, Martin phoned David and I was sent to the office and spoke to Martin and would I drive down to Leicester and have a chat with him. So uh, it all happened quite quickly in the get in the end, although it had seemed that it sort of been on the back burner for quite a few months. And I mean, how convinced? I mean, obviously you, you signed for us, but what was Martin like in those negotiations? Did he sort of, you know, I mean, he always used to joke that he used to reverse the players out into onto the pitch because the stand opposite <laughs> was rubbish, and the one you were coming yeah, out with, of course, yeah. was the car. No, at the time for me, I had a great coach at, at Wednesday called Frank Barlow, and he was like, "You really need to go. You need to go and get some football." You know, I'd had at Rotherham, I'd had a, a a good spell in the team, but I was sort of in and out. Uh, and then at Sheffield Wednesday, it had stuttered and started, and it never really happened. Although I thought it was going to underplay when I started the season, but it didn't. So I needed to do that, and that was obviously to drop down into the Championship. So I didn't really take any convincing. There were one or two other clubs interested, but nothing as, as good or as big as, as Leicester City at the time. Uh, and then I s sat down and had a chat with Martin and, you know, it, it really was a no-brainer. There wasn't much decision to make. My dad had come down with me and we, we sort of went back out into the car park. We had a chat and, uh, you know, decided that, uh, you know, time was ticking by. It was about three in the afternoon and that I needed to, you know, get the get a deal done and uh, go in there and sort it out and sign the contract. And when when you joined, who was sort of your main competition there in in, in the back back line? Uh, I think this might sound a bit terrible, but I think in that position, you you know, Walsh, I think had been having injuries on and off. I mean, yeah. his knees were always an issue. Uh, yeah. How we back, how we <laughs> just... and played through some matches, I, I'll never know. He was, he was obviously, mm -hmm. as we know, a real tough guy. Uh, I think you've got Colin Hill there. He was probably you know coming to the back end of his career. Uh, I mm. think Jimmy Willis was there and, and not, you know, not performing to what Martin would have wanted. So, um, you know, there, there was the main competition, really. Um, you know, and I felt strong at the time and that, you know, I was good enough to get get to get in the side. And and again, you know, that was a big thing for me. And, and after, uh, and we'll come on, obviously, spend a lot more time talking about your time at, at Leicester. Uh, it... Uh, ended up in a move to Bristol, but uh, probably you, you know one of your best times, uh, Luton Town, which we spoke about earlier, um, sixty-seven. Yeah, and, and you you went on a mad scoring spree at Luton Town. <laughs> <laughs> you, you couldn't stop scoring there, could you? <laughs> I, I know. Um, no, I mean Bristol was a bit of a disaster. I went there, and they were just sort of buying a team together. I thought they bought Adiakin Bayou, who less. <laughs> Fans will, will know. Yes, uh, Tony yes. Thorpe, we brought uh, Soren Anderson from Denmark in. And, we, you know, we made quite a few signings and it, it didn't really happen at the start of the season. And unfortunately, by the time we found some form, and I think on the Friday night we beat Bolton, who were top of the league, 2 1. And our form was like, you know, league winning form. It had already been decided that John Ward was going to be replaced. 
Um, and, you know, it was a real sad, sad time for me because after that, you know, I didn't play and, and for the team as well because they ended up getting relegated. But John and the players, we'd all sort of got in together. There was a real sort of like strong unit about us and we, we'd turned the form around. And, and But, you know, the, the carpet was pulled from under John and the new uh, coach came in, Benny Lenardson, and I played one game for him and never played for Bristol again. So, um, you know, that, that was a real sad time, but that led to me going to Luton at the beginning of next se the season after on loan, played for a month and they wanted to sign me and I, I really couldn't wait to get away from Bristol City. Fast, fantastic club that it is. Uh, obviously, it just wasn't going well for me. Yeah, yes. Um, Australia. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I mean, you couldn't get any further. I mean, I know, you know, you went from Bristol to Luton to get away from Bristol. I mean, you couldn't get any further away from Luton. I mean, I just you played 67 games at, at Luton. I say you had your, your your eight goals you scored, and then you you did you you went you went you went down under. Yeah, I mean, it was you know, it's a, it's a funny time and a, the funny the way it happened. But personally, at the time. Um, I think, you know, I was 30 years of age. We'd got relegated at, at Luton. Um, Joe Kinnear had taken over and really, really <laughs> didn't <laughs> rate real life. I don't think. No. <laughs> yeah. And, and he, he, you know, and it, so there, there was nothing else in the offing and you start to worry, you know, where do you go next? Yeah. And, you know, I've seen players turning up at training grounds, you know, when I've, when I've been at clubs uh, with the boots in the car coming on trial and it's, it's, it's really not a pleasant thing to have to go through. And if they don't mm. get, a, you know, success. And I think we've, uh, Julian's frozen again. Uh, just waiting for him to see if he bursts into, into song of Let It Go. Um, I do know Julian, in fairness, was having a lot of trouble with his, uh, with his internet this evening. Never work, I think I've said this before, never work with children, animals, ex-players or the internet. <laughs> and I think, uh, Julian, I don't know if you can still hear us, mate. You you have um you have you have frozen. Not not the most um picturesque of pictures to freeze on, I must say. But uh, let's just see if I can get uh, get hold of you here and um See if you can log back on again. Um, oh, he's gone altogether. The the joy, the joy of um, of modern technology. Like I say, it, we are. Uh, I think I think uh, Julian's internet is powered by uh, by Arsenal, which is probably why it's going down. But um, <laughs> Melina, do you like the old uh, yeah Melina? Just in case you want it, and I don't know if you can see at the back there. I don't know if anybody's got these yet, but the old uh, FA Cup winner's flag. It's got to be done. It has to be done. Yeah, you can't you can't go wrong with an FA Cup final flag. Uh, I've always said that for at least a couple of months. So we'll try to see if we can get Julian back. Because, um, yes, he, he, he did go to Australia and he played for Northern Spirit. And um, we're going to come on, if we can get him back into the... Um, his time at Leicester, uh, when it was quite interesting. Um, but whilst he was at Leicester under Martin O'Neill, we will remember those those years under Martin O'Neill, which at the time, let's face it, they were great years. Um, it, it's you know Martin O'Neill wasn't immediately taken to um, when when he came, um, and. I think sort of we, we we remember the famous going on the radio and uh, and, and and basically answering the fans back, um, which uh, Pearson did in later life, um, but he did it slightly differently, of course. Uh, yeah, so um, we'll just say see if Julian can can get back on at all. Um, Dude, what are your memories? What are your memories? <laughs> Thank you, Melina. <laughs> nice flag, mate. Yeah, you're never going to... Um... Yeah, Julian's just texted me. He's just trying to sort it out. His internet went down quicker than an Arsenal uh, Arsenal Arsenal player when Leicester throw the foot uh, have a throw in against them. My God, you remember that? He went down well. <laughs> um... 
take it off, take it off, take it off. I don't, don't know. Oh, sorry, Andy. I don't watch The Masked Singer. I've got to be honest with you. For me, The Masked Singer is like the, um, uh, what can I say, the, the, the Rochdale of the football world. I mean, how bad has television got when we're coming uh, and watching The Masked Singer? i tell you one thing, one person who I promise you and I guarantee you isn't on The Masked Singer, and that's Julian. Welcome back, mate. Sorry about that. I, I, thought, okay. I, was I, thought, I thought I was boring you, Chris, and you'd turn me off. <laughs> never, never. <laughs> in, fact, in fact, here we go. Look, you see your fans in. Melina, hope Julian's connection comes back. Was Hi, Melina. Um, was it, 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 your um, your uh, um, connection has been looked after by Arsenal there. It's just going down all the time, <laughs> isn't it? You know. But uh, but going back and going back to going down under, I think we were, we yeah, were talking about. It, it was it was just that worry that at the end of my career, no contract in the offering, and I was approached in March. It was through my agent, uh, and. He, uh, he just said there's a three-year deal in Australia. It was like decent money. Um, and it was a funny one. Didn't have uh, have kids at the time. And my, she's now my wife. My girlfriend was driving down to Luton. And I spoke to her on the phone about it. And um, she walked through the door and said, F it, let's go. <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. Not a woman of few words, is she? <laughs> it's uh, it's a true story, and it, it was like, right, we'll we'll do that then. But it, it was literally that. I didn't have anything else, you know, in the pipeline. And I think I'd signed the contract at the end of March, and um, like a pre-contract. And the the earliest contact I had from anyone else was uh, Wickham, and that was like beginning of July, which would be a week before yeah. pre-season. And that might have been a trial, but I was happy to sign this. It was three years, take me through to just short of my 34th birthday. So, uh, and it, you know, it felt like a bit of an adventure as it was, you know, to be yeah. fair. Um, yeah. Let's be honest with you. I think if any of us were offered a job in uh, Australia, we'd, we, 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 we would jump at it, you know. But uh, I think, Andy, we, we did. We, I don't ask where the conversation went while you were gone. <laughs> Uh, we weren't sure whether Andy was talking about the mass singer from earlier, or we think he's, he's, he's tuned into Babe Station here. <laughs> what is it? How does it go? <laughs> no, I don't, I, allegedly that's what they do on Babe Station. Of course, I, I, I don't know at all, you know. But um, it, it didn't really work. Well, you see, you had three three seasons down there, but of course, the the, the is it Northern Spirit? Yeah, they they folded unfortunately, didn't they? Uh, they, they did in the end, and the whole league did uh, after I left. Um, they were, they oh, were your fun. fault, was it? <laughs> yeah, probably, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they, they were funded by Rangers in Scotland, but and they were hoping for the next uh, Harry Harry Cool or Mark Viduka to come over on the cheap. Yes. Uh, none, none of the young lads, unfortunately, in Northern Spirit were interested in, in coming over to, to Scotland. And, you know, uh, Ian Ferguson came over to play the Rangers and, and Scotland captain, and both of us would speak to them all the time and tell them that they, they, you know they're missing out on a fantastic opportunity, uh, and they just really didn't. They just they basically thought it was too cold in Scotland, so <laughs> which was probably a good point as we were living in Sydney. So um, yes, yeah. yeah, and because of that, they, they decided to pull the funding, uh, and we basically ended up in the third season with a new chairman who promised uh, a lot and and delivered you know practically nothing and um we, we stopped getting that paid. Sounds very familiar doesn't it yeah well yeah 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 and we we stopped getting paid and um my wife was pregnant with our second child and we sort of got stuck out there for a few months and it was all a bit uh you know sad at the end because it was a wonderful place i made some great friends the football wasn't fantastic because it was about sixth or seventh in their list of favorite sports uh but it but it was okay uh, but like I say, I had a fabulous time there, you know, other than that. And uh, it just ended quite on a sour note. And, you know, people always ask, why did you come home? And it, it was just, you know, at the time, we just felt we couldn't wait to uh, put our feet down on the concrete at Manchester Airport. Yeah. I mean, you've got to be honest with you. Sydney and... Oh, can you hear me okay? Yep. Yeah, you know Sydney, Glasgow, you know Daddy Chips. I think <laughs> I think I kind of know uh, who would win that one, and I, I don't blame them for not coming over. You know, I mean we we are talking Scottish football here, so uh, 
It would have been a step down for them, wouldn't it, really? <laughs> oh. no, do you know what? One of the young lads I played with has gone on to play for the Australian national side, a kid called Alex Wilkinson, and he was only a teenager at the time. And I'm sure if someone like him had gone across, they would have had every every single opportunity and chance to, to make it in the pro game in Scotland. But like I said, it, yeah. it's... Um, it just didn't happen, and for that reason, you know, Rangers decided they didn't want to fund the club anymore. Which I guess, in fairness, is understandable. Yep. So, going back to your Leicester Leicester years, um, they were they were quite eventful, should we say, <laughs> to put it uh, put it mildly. And I've got a couple of um, highlights for you here, which we'll go through in a second. So, you played in the nineteen ninety six playoff final where we beat we beat Palace. Um, and, and you, you headed the ball back for Steve Claridge when he shinned the winner in. Um, you were part of the 96-97 League Cup squad and played in the semi-final, but you, you missed out on the final. And your goal was in the 3-1 defeat to Chelsea, but you actually put us, you know, you put us in the lead there. So for, for a while, it was, it, was, <laughs> it was looking good. But we spoke briefly about this before we came live, but... And I was fascinated in, in what you said, but let's just, uh, you remember this from the from the playoff final, I'm sure. Square. Now, I'm not sure what's happening here because Zelko Palace, the substitute goalkeeper, is coming on to take Kevin Poole's place. And obviously, something, some conversation has gone on on the bench there, I would think. And maybe Kalax says, look, I am the king when it comes to penalty shootouts. You get me on there and I'll win you this match. The only thing I can imagine that happened. Well, he's a big lad, and whether that they think he fills the goals, you know, and looks a bit more intimidating when penalties are being taken. I think that was the best match he ever had for Leicester, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Clean sheets, anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they obviously never touched the ball. I was surprised because I thought. It might have been a game plan. It might have been in... I mean, it was the 119th minute. He had to get it spot on because if he wasn't spotted, it, you know, it wouldn't have... You know, game would have finished and gone to penalties. But obviously, he got it just right. Because literally, I say, it was in the, in the last minute of uh, of extra time. But you, you knew nothing about it yourself. No, I mean, I'm sure Martin and John and Steve Wolf would... They must have spoke about it, uh, you know, mm. at some point before the game. But... For us, it was you know, it was a, we, we were always talking about the way the, the Palace players were stunned, and maybe that was the reaction you know that helped us you know nick that winner. But you know, I, yeah. I, I think we all looked over and were surprised. And I think I just noticed on that clip the first time that you see him shaking, poorly shaking Gary Par uh, Parker's hand as he goes off, and I think Parks just he seems to glance over at the bench as if to you know what, what's all that about, but. I don't ever remember it being spoken of before. Now, in training, we would have practiced penalties and taken penalties and Poole yeah. would have been in and, and Zelko would have been in. But, you know, th that was uh, it was a huge surprise to us all. But fortunately, it worked out well for us in the end. I mean, my, my conspiracy theory here is that uh, had had it gone to penalties, and I mean, let's be honest with you, and we mentioned this again briefly before we came in, Zelko Kalic, bless him, wasn't wasn't our most popular goalkeeper, you know. He wasn't he wasn't up there with the likes of Gordon Banks and Peter Shilton. And as I said, you know, he he, he used to play with garlic round his neck because he could never come out for crosses. But um, yeah, he went on though to play for AC Milan, so we have to give him give him his due. But I thought, well, maybe if we lose on penalties, Kevin Poole, who was obviously the number one and was a good a good keeper, I, I really uh, liked Kevin Poole. And, and as Ron Atkinson there said, you know, a good shot stopper himself. But it would probably have been easier to blame Kalach rather than rather than Paul if it had all gone pear shaped. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I didn't, I'd not played with Zelko before I came to the club, and you know, the things that I'd heard is, you know, he'd had a couple of games where he'd made a couple of mistakes that had cost cost the team, uh, and that's why he wasn't in, in in goal as I arrived. Pooley was like unbelievable. We called him the cat, and he he just pulled yeah. saves off. Even in, in the final itself, I think Undar slipped by me in the second half, and he's hit it in the top corner, and, and Pooley's just plucked it out the top corner, unbelievably. And you know, that could have been game over for us. So uh, he was a really good lad uh, and a fantastic keeper, great to play with. And, and like you say, you know, it's uh, it was a strange one at the time, and I think we all sort of thought, you know, it's a bit of a surprise. And your second thought is poor old Pooley. Do you know what I mean? Because he had yeah. an, an outstanding game. 
Oh um, God, yeah. It was seemingly saying, but but you've had a great game, Kevin. But he's better at penalties than you, so that you know that's the way it is. If there's any Chelsea fans watching, by the way, that's what your goalkeeper does. When he's being substituted in a final, he goes off. You know, and just, just you know, just that I'd mentioned that there, you know. <laughs> but the thing is, as, as you saw when they swapped over, you could see the logic because, by God, he was he was like a foot taller than, uh, than Paul, he, wasn't he? He was. I mean, I remember in the days I was there and when he left the club, uh, Muzzy Is it bought his house off him. And the door frames had all been made specially because he was six foot seven, <laughs> and so there was these massive door frames that you know he could get through, and it, you know it made uh, Muzzy look quite small as he walked through them. So, uh... <laughs> well, not not long. In fact, seconds after that happened, um, Martin O'Neill was about to get redemption because, of course, he was. He was but that's that. Did, before we move on to that, you you were there obviously when Martin O'Neill was sort of taken on and. Were, were sort of booed, let's be honest. We all remember the Sheffield United game. Mm. What was it like at that time? Well, for me, it was horrific, really, because that was my debut. Uh, we yeah. played it on Sheffield United, who absolutely slaughtered me all the way through the games, obviously, because I'd just come from, from Wednesday. I didn't have a particularly good game, uh, and we lost 2 0. And for me, it was just like, oh, this isn't nowhere near a, a decent start to a career you know another club you want to come in and hit the yeah. ground running and you know you want to put a performance on and show the fans that you know why the reason why the managers bought you and uh, you know I did none of that so for me it was a real tough one to take uh, and Martin did the unexpected as he as he often did and does um, and, it, and again that that sort of paid dividends from I think the fans who went in and relayed the messages out would have a, a lot more respect than they probably did before they went into his office and he would have talked honestly about the you know yeah. the game and the situation and decisions he made uh, and and I think with Martin that was the one thing he was brutally honest sometimes not so nice when you're a player for him but you know that <laughs> honest you know and then the, the supporters yeah. would have gleaned that from that conversation uh, and and after that we did uh, you know turn the form straight around and and go on a fantastic run that led us to Wembley it did and like I say Everybody remembers the famous Shind goal, but there's one player who I don't necessarily think has had, had the credit he deserves, shall we say, for his involvement in there. Now, a certain a certain Julian Watts was involved. Just see, just see if you can spot him here in this next. I did give a bit of a clue there, but I don't know if you spotted yourself <laughs> at all, Julie. <laughs> yeah, it's unfortunate that assists weren't a thing then. <laughs> Whereas now, <laughs> now it's an actual start. And in, in those days, it was all about the scorer. So uh, yeah. typical, of my, typical of my look, it didn't really get much of a mention. And I do remember, I think, I don't know if it was a book that Steve, Mc, uh, Steve Claridge had a lot to do with, but in it, it said he, the ball was headed down by Walsh. I thought he wasn't even on the pitch. <laughs> <laughs> but we saw that afterwards. I, I remember you saying that, you know. It's, uh, at least you could be mistaken with somebody on the pitch. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> you know. But, I mean, I mean, talk us through that because, you know, it was, you know, an amazing couple of minutes, wasn't it? From, from, from Zelko coming on to the free kick being taken. It, it was. I mean, I, I remember at the time, I mean, like, they'd got Undar and I can't remember the other lad up front and... God, they'd been at us all game, and I was honestly, I mean, it was like deep into injury, uh, into extra time. I just remember being like absolutely sapped of energy. Obviously, I used to go up for all the free kicks and uh, yeah. and corners, and then and it was such a tired jump. And you, you can't if you if you look at it in slow motion, we both sort of head it together. It puts a funny spin on the ball, so 
Yeah. Uh, I, still will, I still will take the credit, obviously, but uh, <laughs> I wasn't going to mention that. But <laughs> you, you're quite right; it does kind of go between you. But I'm sure your, yours was the last head on it. <laughs> well, I, I hope so. Anyway, but um, yeah, and I, I, I mustered the energy to sprint over to Courage and the rest of the lads. I don't know, but I do have this absolute vivid memory of as it calmed down and I walked away. And I was, th- I was thinking personally, there was five plus minutes left. And I yes. just thought, I don't know how I'm going to get through, you know, these next few minutes because I literally didn't have anything left in the tank. And Colin Hill had come on uh, for Walshie, who was struggling, and come on next to me. And I, I think I remember saying to him, like, Chilly, look, you're going to have to look after me, pal. I said, like, there's not a lot left. And, and literally they kicked off, and I think there was a couple of passes. And the for me, it wasn't – I don't think it was the excitement of winning. It was relief <laughs> that the game was over. I didn't have to chase anyone anymore, and it was all done and dusted and, you know, and I, I think I went – it was Neil Lennon who I went to first, and we were yeah. – yeah, it was just uh, – it was quite a surreal moment that obviously you'd never forget. I mean, the adrenaline must have been pumping like, like mad. I remember – um, Steve Howard, um, when he did like yourself, um, on the website, lesslittleidie.com, we have a page called Favourite Things, um, where, where you were asked sort of five, five things about uh, your time at Leicester. And he said that his goal was sort of uh, when he scored against Leeds. And he said, I don't know how I got that far up the pitch at that time. Well, <laughs> he said, that yeah, was knackered. Yeah. But it is adrenaline gives you that extra yeah. boost. It is. You just, you know, I know Steve as well. I played with Steve at Luton. He's a cracking lad. Yeah. But um, yeah, it is. You, you know, you, you think you, you, you've got nothing left and that you're totally spent and, you know, something happens and you just have to find it and you do. And that's, that's just the fitness that, you know, you go through every week and right the way through the season and the stamina that builds up and somehow you do it. But I think when you stand still in that moment and, you know, you're heavy breathing, your legs are tired, you, you just, you're thinking yourself, it's like, you know, I can't, I'm not really going to be able to carry on here, but you do find it from somewhere in the tank. You do. Good evening, Rich. Um, <coughs> one second. <coughs> that went down the wrong way. Um, good evening, Rich. A Man United fan. We won't hold that against you. Good evening, Rich. Um, and we've got a Spurs fan. Good evening, sir. How the devil are you, Tommy? Uh, are you happy to shall let you win the FA Cup to make them hungry for the Champions League final? Mate. You know, we, we, we win cups. You know, you've forgotten what this is like at Spurs. You know, I mean, I know you're talking about a new manager, but is that the third or fourth choice after the German and, and, and Brendan both turned you down? You know, but uh, he's a good lad, Tom. He likes a, likes a bit of banter. He has to be in a, being a Spurs fan, doesn't he? We said earlier, we talked about your scoring spree when you, when you moved on to Luton. Um, but you actually... Got a goal. <laughs> that sounds really bad the way I said that. <laughs> but actually, you didn't get one while you were at Leicester. And in fairness, you were a defender and you, you weren't sort of turned into a striker the, the, quite the same way that, that, that Walshie was. But um, you, you did get uh, you did get <laughs> the one goal. I can't make this sound any better than it's coming out as much as I'm trying. <laughs> you did score your goal uh, and against Chelsea. Talking yeah. to that's, that's yeah. too long. Yeah. even worse after you've said all that, Chris. It was only actually a tap into an empty net, really. So uh... <laughs> I, just, they caught me through it. I thought this was going to be like I was going to go off and go to the toilet while you yeah. talked through it. it no, was... it was. Uh, it was. I think. I think Marshy had gone up with the keeper or the defender, and they were both they were both out of action after Marshy had uh, clattered them, and it it literally just b- bounced down and felt perfect to me, and. Um, and we scored, and the shame of the game was, I think we caught Chelsea. We were at a multitude of superstars at the time. Yeah. Viala was playing yeah. up front, Zola, you know, the rest of them. And I think we'd sort of, we'd, we'd not certainly dominated the game, but we'd, we'd sort of held our own the first half, and we'd, we'd done really well. And then to nick that yeah. just before half time uh, really gave us some impetus. And whatever their gaffer said to them at half time worked because they came out and they were a different team. And you know, we we really struggled that second half, and unfortunately, I mean. You know, you never. If you score and you lose, it doesn't really, it doesn't really seem to mean anything. If I'm honest, is so, you know, if you score the winner somewhere, brilliant. Or if you yes. get them back in the game, but you know, to score and for the game to fizzle out the way that it did, um, you know, was a bit disappointing. Yeah. For us. but you know, it's, it's a goal. Well, now I'm sort of like you know, kicked you in the privates and made you feel really <laughs> bad. Let, let, let's try and boost you up a little bit here, mate, because you did, and I didn't realise this fact about you, but let, let's let, let, let's enjoy the moment that you actually were brought on up front to replace 
the then most expensive uh, expensive player in the world. He wasn't then, but he went on to be, uh, and I can't remember his name. There were two players who came to us, Stefanovic. Hang on, you, you, you deserve this for, for this story. You deserve that. No, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Stefanovic and, and another guy, and they, they'd got uh, you know, reputation of young up-and-coming, uh, and it just didn't work out for the striker. I mean, I think he'd come in to replace you know, David Erst, um, <laughs> who'd, who'd had a few injury problems, and you know, it was, a, it was at Sheffield Wednesday under David Pleat, and it just didn't really happen, happen for him. And, and in actual fact, the, the team under Pleat really struggled at first. We didn't really get any rhythm going earlier on in the season. And, he, um, yeah, we were playing away at Spurs, fully enough, while we've got a Spurs fan on at White Hart Lane. Uh, and, and he just wasn't doing it. And, you know, Danny Begara, the assistant, turned around to me and said, you know, can you do any better? I obviously lied and answered yes. Uh, <laughs> within a couple of minutes, uh, I, I was on the pitch. And I think I only had a couple of touches. But yeah, he went on. I, I think Juventus signed him for £20 million. And at that time, that was as much money as anyone had been uh, bought for in the world. So, uh, yeah, that, that's one of the small That, that was your moment. Things. If a goal <laughs> against Chelsea for Leicester wasn't, that, that yeah. cling on to that, Julian. Cling on to I, that. I always do. I always do. <laughs> okay. Um, got up into the um, Premier League. That tell tell me the difference between playing as was then. Yeah, you, you you won season in, in 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 the second tier. How how you know you going out in these big stadiums against these big you know big clubs. You know we were still at Filbert Street at the time. What was it like? Was it scary or was it just, again, was it the adrenaline going? No, I mean, I think I'd had a good experience, you know, at Wednesday. I didn't play a lot of games. It might have been 18 or so. But, you know, they were. I think they were nearly all, you know, Premier League games. The season I signed for Wednesday was the, in the March, was the last year of, of Div Division 1. And then they were into right. the Premier League. So, you know, I was at a Premier League club and I'd played a few games there before I came to Leicester. And, Funnily enough, I, I remember going in to see Martin after the after we'd won the playoffs, um, and I, I said to him that I felt that we didn't really. I said without signing anyone, I felt felt would be all right, and obviously we did make a few uh, good signings, as it turns out. But what I experienced at Leicester was, you know, the to get the togetherness of the squad, uh, and that is something. I don't think I'd experienced before. Well, in fact, I hadn't, and not something I think I've experienced. Since and that's no disrespect to other teammates or other clubs. It was no. we were just incredibly close and and daft as it was, a lot of that was that we socialised together. You know, after the game, we went out on a Saturday night. We'd go out Sunday afternoon. You know, and that was the lads. It wasn't with the wives or anything. <laughs> poor, poor old wags were were left at home. And but it, it, we just created this unbelievable bond. And it was a big thing about if your mates off the pitch, you want to help each other more on the pitch because you, you know you, you care about each other, your mates with each yeah. other. You want to help your mates out. And it, it really, that's always sunk in with me, that right the way since. And even though I've managed like a very low level, but it's always something I've tried to instill in players that I've coached. It, it was a, uh, it made us such a strong unit. And, and that carried us through. It carried us through to the playoff final. And it carried us through a lot of games in that first season in the Premier League. I've no doubt about it. And no disrespect to, you know, the other managers you played for. Was Martin O'Neill the best you played under? <laughs> Unbelievably, uh, no, he was. Um, Please don't say Martin. Neil Warnock. Whatever no, you do, no, no. Um, Neil Warnock. The thing with Martin is he, he, he'd got a style about him, and some players really thrived on him. He, he was a very clever bloke off the pitch, uh, but he really got into you, and it really sort of took me the other way. And I, you know, I, I struggled with confidence at times. And it was, you know, I remember games coming up to the, you know, in the Premier League and the Championship where. We'd walk in, and this was a laughing joke, well, a standard joke between the lads because it was just happening at the time. And I'd get five minutes to myself where it was, he'd point out every mistake I'd made that off. And, it, you know, it, it started to eat away at me at the time there. So, mm. you know, from that, for me, I had a great time there. But, you know, I had a manager in Lenny Lawrence at Luton who was totally the other way. Uh, he was very encouraging, and I had a, had a couple yeah. of bad games there, and he pulled me in the office, and he had a chat that sort of lifted me a little bit. And then I went in and I played 51 out of 53 games that season. I missed one through injury, one through suspension. And so playing-wise, that was my best season. And, you know, after about five games, another manager might have pulled me out. You know, and it was yeah. literally, I'd had two bad spells in two games. And he was like, you know, I know you're better than this. And we had a real good chat about it. 
but I felt better going into the next game and managed to turn it around. And we had a really young squad and I was one of the older players and, you know, we had a good balance there. Uh, and like I say, it was probably as a player, as in game time, the best season I had. And, you know, if, if that had been a different scenario, it might have been that I ended up <laughs> on the bench for the game. Someone can come in and do well and, you, you know, the, yeah. your game time becomes a lot, a lot more sporadic. So, um, you know, Martin's a great manager. I get on great with him, you know, off the pitch, but his style wasn't sort of getting the best out of me, if I was going to put yes. it like that. And Jamie Lawrence was, was, you know, was a good, you know, he was a great manager as well, wasn't he? You know, he... Uh, he did, he did, you know, generally did well wherever he went. We went up that season, like we say, though. Um, Favourites to go back down, where we've heard that before. And um, we didn't. Well, we ended up, I think it was 10th, certainly mid-table safety, oh. and yeah. got uh, all the way to a League Cup final, which you played in, I think, most of the games leading up to the final, but didn't quite. And I'm sorry to bring this up again. You know, <laughs> kick, kick, kick a man while he's down, <laughs> but uh, you didn't make it into into the. Were you in the squad for the final, or you just didn't make it into the squad? Yeah. Or no, I, I was in the squad, and um, I mean, I'd, I'd like I'd made the mistake in the semi final or two mistakes, which led to to their goal. Uh, having that, having said that, if I'm honest, I, I felt like I mean, we all bat. It was one of the you know biggest battles as a as a player in a team to play against Wimbledon down there. Uh, you know, I came off. I've got a massive shiner, bruises all over me. I had a, a big battle. Um, you know, with the, I, can't, I can't remember his name, the striker, uh, and it was a real bruising thing. And I, I sort of felt proud of myself afterwards that I'd stood up to all that. Um, but obviously I'd made the mistakes, but then we changed the formation for the final so that Pontus could man mark Janino at Middlesbrough and yeah. that made, meant taking one of the back three out. And unfortunately, you know, that was me and all, you know, right now you can say it was the right decision because, you know, we go and win it in the replay. But for me personally, and Jamie Lawrence as well, who played every round, we were both omitted from the first 11 and, you know, obviously didn't get a place on the bench either. No. Um, so true. This is quite true. We, we, we took ourselves off to the, players lounge and it, we, we drank six pints of guinness each in a very short space of time just to uh <laughs> yeah, with a disappointment which again was something we did then and wouldn't do now yeah so oh, you wouldn't drink that much now yes come on <laughs> <laughs> yeah i was about to say some things never change yeah <laughs> but uh but we, we, you got a medal though didn't you yeah, got a medal. Yeah, yeah, yeah still got yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, I hope that. Uh, I hope it's not hung up in the toilet uh, downstairs toilet. I hope it's got <laughs> pride of place somewhere. You know, it has. It has. It certainly has. Yeah. Good. 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 Now, obviously, winning the uh, um, the, the league cup in them days, that you know, and it, it makes me laugh because, like, you know, the big clubs, you know, were putting B teams out, and they, you know, didn't seem to have that interest in it. But it was a place in Europe, and we got into Europe. And as we always seem to, then, now, even, we got Atletico Madrid. <laughs> and we, it couldn't have started any better. And I remember watching it. Uh, I don't even think the channel I was watching on it exists anymore. But it was one of these uh, Middle Eastern channels. And Gordon Banks was co-commentator on it. Bless him and, and rest in peace, Gordon. But it was a great start in the first in the first leg. Now, you didn't play in the first leg, did you? No. Um, there's a pattern developing here. I didn't want to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> I just noticed a bit of a pattern developing. <laughs> You'll never come on again, will you? I know, but no. <laughs> but uh, we managed to, uh, was it? I'm just trying to get the information up here. Um, it was, we, we, well, the first leg was 2 1 after, um, somehow Marshall, Ian uh, Marshy, big Marshy there, putting us ahead. Uh, but of course, it was the second leg when it all went off, didn't it? It did, and you know, it was interesting for me. I'd been on loan at Crew uh, for the first leg, and I was just finishing my loan spell there, and I'd literally uh, came back, and this was the first game. Uh, and no, I remember, no. I remember being in the changing rooms, uh, and I think Paul, who's still the kit man now. Uh, Steve Walford asked him, you know, he's, he's, what's his kit here? And he went, no, it's at the training ground. I was in the squad, but obviously yeah. no one thought I'd play. And uh, he says, well, you best go and get it because he's starting. So we literally <laughs> shot for the training ground. If, if you know, he'd said it wasn't there. So if that's true, he would have had to go and get it. But And it was because Marsh had caused them such a problem. 
uh, in the first leg. And, you know, if, while I'd not been at, uh, while I'd been at crew, Marsh had sort of filled in sometimes at centre-back. But yeah. he felt that they'd rather sort of put me in there uh, and, and, and leave Marsh up front because he'd been such a handful in the first leg. And then it all went wrong. If I, if I say those two words to you, Remy Harrell, <laughs> who, uh, <laughs> who I don't, if my memory serves me right, never went on to referee again. I mean, you know, it, there was nothing ever official. There's a lot of allegations flying about. But, I mean, when you're in that situation, and obviously, you know, because, you know, nothing was ever proved but he, you know he didn't he didn't ref again which kind of sums it up but you know when you're in that situation you're looking at it and every decision is going against you and it was you know it wasn't a case of you know it wasn't the fact that he was a bad ref and both sides were suffering <laughs> it was yeah. just Leicester how did that how do you feel as a player when you're in that situation well, you feel up against it. I mean, we, we knew what a great side they were. Um, you know, and the guy I played again, it was Kiko. He was like, you know, in the Spanish team at the time or in the squads and what have yeah. you. And it was such a good, you know, team. Janino was there, you know, nemesis from Middlesbrough. Um, mm -hmm. And you, you felt, you walk on the pitch knowing it's going to be a really tough game and that you're up against it. And then to add, you know, the decisions. And it might have been that at the time that we weren't really simulated in England and they were abroad and, you know, the referee was buying into it. Uh, but it just felt like, you know, well, it did everything sort of went against us. Um, mm. Every time we touched them, they fell to the floor and the ref was giving it. And, you know, at the time, you can see it in the game every every week now, every game. But, you know, then it wasn't a thing. And you just thought, you know, you couldn't believe that players were diving about and they were getting the free kicks from it. It was, you know, you could almost laugh to yourself in disbelief. Yeah. Uh, but it, you know it went on and on and and then for you know to send Parks off for the uh, taking the free kick too quickly. I mean we were just in disbelief. I remember on the pitch how angry we were. Mm. You know all of us over to the ref uh, and I just thought you can't book someone for that. You know it, it's not a thing. Um, and but then he sent him off and and again you know the the pressure of what you were up against just sort of doubled at that point thinking, you know, we're on, uh, we're with 10 men now against a really good team, you know, we're in this tie that we've really got our backs against the wall. Uh, and unfortunately in the end of that, you know, it, it went against us, but I think we walked off with our heads held high on the night. We were so disappointed, but we did feel cheated and robbed, you know, to this day. Uh, and it, it was a tough one to take, but, um, you know, like I say, I think we, we did our best and we were just up against, 12 men in the end and uh, that was yes. decided yeah and and I would until I actually looked at this and I hadn't realized um because of course we always think about Gary Parker getting getting sent off but they had a player sent off as well yeah they did but I, you know I, th I think by that time you know it, it was more or less over and done we were I think I could see that we were tiring uh, they had more possession of the ball, and, and, and like I say it was um it was a, a brief glimmer of hope but we just couldn't get back into the game Ah. Well, like I say, it's one of those games that has gone down in in history, and you were you were part of it. But looking back on on your career, and you know, we'll we'll, we'll make this the last question now. Um, although we've got we have got Mel sort of just quickly to go back to Mel's question right at the start. Your, I think it was your favourite game. I'm presuming yeah. we're going to go for the playoff, but I could be wrong. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't that nil nil draw away at Scunthorpe for Rotherham United. I know that. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, that must be a close second, though. <laughs> no, I mean, I've had some memorable moments. I think I played in the first FA Cup tie that ever went to penalties. And funnily enough, that I think that was against Scunthorpe for Rotherham United. And <laughs> it was when they just made penalties a thing in the FA Cup. And our, our sort of early round uh, draw at Millmore went to penalties and Ali Pickering scored the winner. But no, for me, Can coming to left... We have got a Man United fan in the house. We're rich. So be careful what you say about penalties. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, no, I mean coming to Leicester was great. We, you know, after the the disappointment of that first game, it was it was really tough to take. But to go on a good run, get to know the lads and the way we sort of performed, and you know things we did off the pitch and on the pitch, and you know we socialised together. It was just a really good time. And, and then to culminate that in the final at the end, um, you know, it was like Roy the Rover stuff. I think it was like twelve games, and I was at Wembley after leaving Sheffield Wednesday. So yeah. you know, for me, it was like as well, you know. You, you think, well, I'm, I'm, I'm dropping down a league and all of a sudden I'm, I'm back in that, that league again. So, 
you know, that everything sort of associated it, you know, the run going away to Palace winning 1 0, going away to Charlton winning 1 0 on the Tuesday night before that. Unbelievable results because they were, they were all above us and in the top six. So, um, you know, everything about it was, was just a, a great time. And I mean, that's why I love the club so much still. It's the, you know, the, the times we're having right now are fantastic for supporters. Uh, and yeah. the players, obviously, and, the man- and everything, everyone involved in the club. And I also look back at that period I was there, not much to do with me, but just everything that happened at the time was was really good and had the feel-good factor and culminating in the promotion, staying up in yeah. the Premier League, winning the Cup. You know, everything was good about it. So, yeah, the, the Cup yeah. final, the playoff final was definitely that the high point and unfortunately a year later suffered the low point. Yes, yeah. Um, just quickly mention there, a couple of channels, um, if you want to sub on uh, YouTube, because these guys do have some great content on their channels, not just about their own team, but Turf Moor um, House TV. It's a new channel for Burnley, and he's going to be coming on on the show. We'll tell you a bit more about that in a minute. Uh, we'll, we'll be talking to him tomorrow night. Uh, Rich Sports, he's the Man United fan. Does a lot of non-Man United content. Give that a subscribe. That's great. And Spurs Zone TV likes a bit of banter. And if you do nothing other than subscribe to his channel and go on and give him grief because Spurs are so bad at the moment, just do it because that's all I do. I've got to be honest with you. I only ever go on and give him grief. And it's great. Uh, the funny thing is, Julian, is going on to some of these other channels because Melina as well, Miss Melina, her channel uh, under Miss Melina. She's an Arsenal fan. She um, which also does cooking, if anybody's interested in cooking. But... Um, the lovely thing is that you can actually see Arsenal fans and Tottenham fans have both now got something in common. You know, the the, the fact that both the sets of teams are shit. But, you know. <laughs> and, you know, there was, there was me and Arsenal and a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a Tottenham fan, and I was the only happy one. But, <laughs> but quickly fit this in, because I appreciate we're going on now. Ralph, uh, Rich, sorry, Ralph. <laughs> Rich has just said, best Man United player you game up against. Uh, bad memories of Man United. Lost five nil at Old Trafford for Chef Wednesday, and I, I had to. I was farmed out to right back, uh, and I marked Giggs, and it, it was four nil at half time. He was giving me a torrid time, and I think Ferguson felt that sorry for me. He actually took him off, so I didn't have to face <laughs> it the second half. But uh, on that, I've got to say, uh, Cantona. Um, you know, by you know, I was lucky enough in that era of all the foreign players coming over to. I've played against like some fantastic big big names. Obviously, from the past now, but your your Viales, you know, your Zolas, Cantona, you know, and all. I mean, that yeah. Manchester United time at the time, Kanchelskis, Giggs, Hughes, and uh, Cantona were the top four. Uh, absolutely frightening De- and destroyed us on the night, to be fair. So, yeah, definitively answering that, definitely uh, Eric Cantona, fantastic talent. You 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 can't you can't knock the talent that he had, you know. We won't. We won't mention the kick. But uh, Julian, it has been great. You've, you've, you know, as I said the other night, you've made a happy man feel very old because I remember. <laughs> <laughs> I remember most of this, and I tell you something. One, one of us has aged better than the other, and I. <laughs> That's the first compliment I've had all night, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. you it was you yeah. there, weren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. It might not have been you. <laughs> but, uh, oh, Julian, it is great. Hopefully we'll have you back on, obviously, with some yeah. post-match shows and, and other shows as we go on. You're a great Definitely. supporter of the channel, and it's been a great show tonight. Thanks for coming on. And I'm I'm sorry for keep mentioning all the bad things that happened. <laughs> you can need a drink. <laughs> that, that's like a catchphrase, isn't it? <laughs> but uh, but Julian, hey, no, seriously, I, oh, and he's gone again. <laughs> hey, Julian, I hope that was your internet. I hope I didn't upset you. <laughs> but uh, I don't know what to say now. Uh, no, thanks very much, uh, there, Julian. He's a great supporter of the channel. And remember those other channels that I called out. Give them a, a, a support and a like as well. If you want to watch this back, you can do. Um, please, like I said right at the start, give us you know hit that uh, like button, give it a smash, the old notifications, and please subscribe to the channel. It would help us grow immensely. Um, you can watch us back on YouTube on Leicester Till I Die TV. Um, and I think Julian's just texted me here. 
Um, <laughs> he said, I, I will say this from him. Sorry it went off again. Uh, cheers for the show. Really enjoyed it. Thanks, Julian. It was great to have you on. And this will be up in podcast form in an hour or so on Amazon Music, Google, Apple iTunes, Spotify, and Anchor, to name but a few. So there we go. Um just to let you know, tomorrow night's show, we're doing a special tomorrow night. We've got a couple of these coming up during the off-season. Uh, Turf, Turf, <laughs> Turf More House TV. Turf More House TV. Uh, coming on there from uh, Dan, from, from the Burnley fan. And we're going to have a look at each of the season and what we thought of the season. You know, one of us did... Slightly better than the other one. Let's be honest with you. We can't. Uh, we can't lie about that. Sorry, mate. You know. But we will be back tomorrow night at seven. Thanks very much for joining in tonight. Um, let's just have a little reminder of this, just for Mel. It didn't happen in 49, 61, 63 or 69 when they reached the final. But the class of 2021 have delivered. Leicester City are FA Cup winners at last. And our history makers at Wembley. Leicester Till I Die TV, home of the FA Cup winners. Oh, we are, and we've got 12 months of being able to play that. Guys, thanks for joining in. Uh, thanks for your comments. Remember, like I say, smash those likes. Um, give us a subscribe. Give us a follow. Do all that. We're forever grateful. See you back tomorrow with the Burnley Opposition Review and uh, at 7 o'clock tomorrow night. Same place, same channel. Don't go away. Don't touch those dials. Good Hello, night. Matt Elliott here. Be sure to watch Leicester Till I Die TV on YouTube. And follow all their social media platforms for all the latest updates and news on Leicester City Football Club. Thanks for watching Leicester Till I Die. This is Chris saying goodbye and see you next time. Some people are on the pitch, they think it's all over. It is now. <laughs>